here. She is a, um, Kate Donovan is a garden coach with the Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. The Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens, their mission is to inspire others to grow their own fresh produce. They deliver residential and community-based training, consulting and assistance in vegetable garden, in the vegetable garden. We, they are dedicated to the belief that most people should have the knowledge and opportunity to grow wholesome fruits and veggies in containers, raised beds, or in ground gardens. And tonight, she's gonna to cover the life cycle of seeds. Uh, this presentation is all about sowing, harvesting, and storing seeds. And audience members will learn about all types of seeds starting, as well as which seeds to harvest and how to store them to add to your sustainable life. So thank you so much, Kate Donovan, for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it and um, enjoy everyone. Thank you. Let me start the presentation. Oh, and as a reminder, everybody, if you have questions, please send them to the chat and we'll read them. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm visible, right? My screen? Yep. yep. Okay, perfect. So I have one more thing to add to my resume that I didn't do. <laughs> I didn't have back when I, I, when I wrote it up. I'm actually, I actually started a new, garden, a new garden club from my town, Blackstone and Millville. Uh, there's there's a, a need for garden clubs in this area because it's very rural. And we, we have gardener, gardening in our DNA, gardening and farming in our DNA. But a lot of the garden clubs are dying off. They, they're, you know, they're mostly, mostly women, mostly retirees, and they do a lot of flowers. Well, we do a whole bunch of stuff from, you know, we, we support a, a community garden that gives all the food to the food pantry. We do a lot of mentoring, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, it's all good. That's a nonprofit part of, part of my life. So I have 21 uh, different, uh, I think 21, maybe 22 different presentations on gardening. The majority of them are on food growing and sustainability. So I, I also, as part of the package that I give to the, li uh, the libraries, garden clubs and senior centers and pe people that host me, I do, I do give the presentation via email. Uh, if we were in a room together, you know, before COVID, I would hand a sign up sheet and you would give me your email and I would send you the PowerPoint. But we're not there. So you'll have to send me the uh, your, your uh, email so that I can forward you the, the PowerPoint. So this is my name again, Kate Donovan. This is my email and this is my website. My website also has a contact us link, which is uh which you know you can type in and send me an email, tell me what you want. And you also ask me any questions about gardening. Believe me, I don't know everything, but if there's something I don't know, I can certainly crowdsource my Facebook group or do some research into the 20,000 books that I have on my shelves over here or the 5 trillion different articles that we have out on, on, uh, in a Google's reach. So, uh, so anyway, please you know, feel free to contact me. If you do go into my website, Make sure to look at the uh, 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 there's a con there's a there's a one of the pages is upcoming events because we have a lot of Zoom events perhaps something that Chelmsford isn't uh, running but another another group is also this links to our YouTube and we have a lot of videos out there some of them are of these very presentations that have been recorded and others are you know, Eric and myself out in the garden doing our thing and doing some, some lectures and fun stuff. So anyway, keep in touch, please. We'll be together for a while. We have a few presentations here in Chelmsford. So it's nice to, since we're so, we're virtual, it is nice to get a, a you know, get to know you all. Okay, so this, what are we doing here? We're gonna learn all about how to plant seeds, how to harvest them, how to store them. Last year, we had pretty much a seed shortage. I mean, it was really hard to get seeds. You'd get a seed, a, a package of seeds, and I mean, you'd go to look for one, and they didn't have that variety. So you, you had to, you know, go look someplace else or go on a different website. And some of the websites went down. You know, they were down two weeks, and maybe one or two weeks out of the month because the the crew was was out with, with COVID, unfortunately. So there was a lot of issues with seeds. And seeds, it can be expensive. You know, we have some places that are really, really good. For example, 
dollarseed.com. I'm not going to tell you how much those seeds are. Obviously, it's obvious. They're a dollar pack, full-size seeds. And also, Little Shop of Seeds has full-size bags of packages of seeds for 75 cents. They're the same thing that you buy at Burpee or you buy at, uh, at Baker Creek for, for much more money, although they don't have the huge variety. But you can get them less expensively. And also, you can save your own. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Save your own. Because one thing you know for sure, if you have some carrots that grew really well for you and you save the seeds, you know they're gonna, the seeds are going to grow really well because they're acclimated to our environment and the parents already been, you know, done, did well here. So you know that the best way to have a sustainable garden is to grow, is to save your own seeds. Now, before you plant, when you, when you go and get, I get a lot, a lot of questions from people and I don't mind. Uh, but when I, when I get a lot of questions, what I do is I, I, I I'm more apt instead of to tell you the answers to send you to the resource. Because if you're serious about being sustainable and growing food, there's a few things you have to know. One of them is your hardiness zone. Now, a hard, so because anytime you say, um, you know, when do I start my carrots? When do I start my tomatoes? When do I, you know, when, you know, when do I start a specific seed? That all depends on your hardiness zone. You know, can I grow figs in my, you know, can I grow such and such a flower is, is you know, and you have to know, and, and you have to tell in the Google search, you have to specify that you're in zone 6A. And I, I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, but that is the determination that's made by the, the, uh, the United States uh, to a Department of Agriculture to give an idea of where you are and where your, your freeze, freeze zone is and where you find when, the time zone that you finally uh, are able to plant. So also what you need to know about planting seeds is, you know, what are your cool weather crops? What are your warm weather crops? You can be a really good gardener, but if you plant watermelon seeds in March in New England, I'm sorry, but those are gonna die before, long before they even, even germinate. So you have to know what plant is what and when it can be planted because each seed has, is, is a, a different life. It's a different life form. They all have different life cycles. Also, uh, before you undertake this new endeavor of being a sustainable food grower, you have to know what do you want to do and how do you want to start your seeds? Do you want to purchase a light to grow, to start your seeds indoors? My company has a whole presentation on indoor seed starting. You know, I went with a friend of mine, I believe it was, I think it was maybe even two years ago. She wanted to start up and she wanted to be more sustainable and she wanted to get a, an LED light because those are pretty much the standard now. They used to have the, I have the fluorescence, but they run a little bit warm and they can damage your seedlings if you're not careful about them. But she wanted to get a, a good sized light that could grow a couple of flats of, of crops underneath. So we went to Job Lot and got one for 24 bucks. Now, of course, in the last couple of years, prices have gone up. So I doubt it's probably more than 30, but you can get it. And this, in, in your grow lights that you get are specific to growing. They have uh, this, this, uh, a cer certain spectrum in that light that allows for the light to emulate the sunlight so that you have a better opportunity, your plants have a better opportunity to thrive. Also, you know, we were talking before the presentation started, I have a lot of plants that I sowed already, so seeds that I sowed already. I used a presentation called milk jug sowing, also known as winter sowing. And I have a little video to share with you um, on winter, on, on milk jug sowing. I advise everybody to do it if you're a cheapskate and you don't wanna, you know, uh, be bottlenecked with all that work starting your seeds under lights. Also direct sowing, there are a lot of 
lot of plants that you can grow that you don't need to start the seeds at all. For example, beans, peas, lettuce, uh, cucumber, any kind of squash can all be direct sown in the ground. If you're smart about it, I mean, you may want to get a head start, and you're, you know, and you're more than welcome to do that, but make sure you follow the instructions for that particular plant. For example, you're supposed to start tomatoes probably, I don't know, maybe eight, eight uh, weeks before you plant them out. But if you plant a cucumber eight weeks before you plant it out, it won't like it. It will probably die on you. It'll struggle. So read the instructions about the particular plant that you're growing before you undertake it. And you have to have a calendar. You know, this week I have to start my beet seeds and next week I have to, you know, harvest my such and such, whatever it is. You really have to keep a calendar. A lot of people have a, you know, th there's a template you can pull into Microsoft Word or you can just make the updates on a, on a, you know, $3 calendar that you get. And, uh, but make sure you write everything down. This is a, I don't know what you are. I think you may be, most of New England is zone six, unless you're in the mountains. And I know you're not. I used to live in Hudson. It's not too far from you guys. I think you're in zone six A, same as me. And this is the little schedule that I have for you. And, and please send me your email and, and, I'll, and I'll send you this uh, schedule for a lot of the plants that, uh, that you commonly would grow in this environment. For example, and, and it has a nice little legend up here. Start the seeds indoors as the orange and then plant or transplant outdoors in, in the yellow and then harvest in the green. So there's a couple of things you notice about a, a few crops. One of them is kale. You know that kale likes the cool weather so you can start it in March. It doesn't mind, it laughs at the cold. You know, uh, uh, you, you try to start a, a eggplant in the cold weather and, and it'll, it'll just shrivel up and do nothing, but the kale seems to really thrive. You can start your kale, you can transplant it outdoors mid-March. And then, you know, it doesn't really do that well. They kind of languish in the summertime. So you might as well pull it in May and then come September, you can plant it again and then you'll have it harvested right through to um, Thanksgiving. Yes, I do, har I do harvest, I do eat from my garden for about 10 months out of the year. I actually went out today to see if I could dig up any of my carrots, but they were frozen over. Unfortunately, that happens. So lettuce, the same thing. You have two different crops of lettuce that you can start, actually four different crops of lettuce. You succession plant. You don't want it to, and, and the other thing about lettuce, you know, or any, any type of seed, uh, seed like that is you don't want, lettuce has a tendency to come up and die. It, it hits the, it hits the, the, the cool, the, the warm weather and it, and it goes to seed on you, bolts to seed, they call it. So whatever you do, if you're going to plant lettuce or any green, try to plant more than one kind. So you'll have a steady stream and they won't all come to fruition at the same time because some crops like lettuce, are, they're very hard to store. You know, if it's, I don't know, I'm trying to think if it's spinach, you can dehydrate or you can freeze it or whatever, but Good luck doing that with lettuce. It's not going to not going to hold up well. So anyway, you'll see these and you see there's several plants uh, that have more than one growing cycle. And that's called succession planting, uh, succession planting. And you can do that uh, as well. That's just one little cheat sheet. And I told you about the hardiness map. And we have to know what zone we're in, because when we buy a seed, you know, you want to buy a seed and you say, well, when, what, when do I plant the seed? It'll tell you if you're in zone six, you plant it at a specific time. So just to let you know where we're at, we're zone six and we're the green right here, actually. So ironically, we're in the same zone as somebody in way down south here, even down south in New Mexico. A lot of times because these places are in higher, higher elevation, but typically the uh, 
uh, the Midwest is a lot colder than we are on the coast. And then all the way up here in uh, up to Washington state. So that's where zone six leads us. There are actually gardening groups that pertain to, yeah, I think I'm actually in a zone six gardening group. It's nice because my group is a worldwide gardening group. So I get input from everyone, but you know, to be specifically in a gardening group on Facebook with people who are dealing with the same issues you are in real time can be helpful. So that's the USDA plant hardiness zone map. And if you're not sure of where you're at, if you go into Google, put in your zip code and just like mine, I'll just say 01504 space hardiness space zone. It will tell me that my my zone is uh, is zone six, specifically zone six A. Okay, so let's talk about seeds, and I and I put some zinnias in here just to let you know. I don't just do uh, I I'm a food grower, but I like to put a little bit in there for our our followers out there that that grow flowers as well. So let's look at the back and find out what we can tell about uh, about a, a seed by looking at the package. Uh, first of all, you see the name over here in plain English. It's a zinnia. Secondly, you see a Latin name, zinnia elegans. So I have a friend of mine. She's from Europe. Actually, she's from England. And, you know, she she's a real good one for the Latin names. Everybody in the world, uh, pretty much, you know, pretty much anyone in the world, if you want to refer to a, a a zinnia, and you're talking to someone that doesn't speak English, uh, everybody uses this as a common denominator, the Latin name. So then, then it tells you the type of plant. Is it an annual or a perennial? This is a zinnia. A zinnia is an annual, which means that it has a one-year life cycle. Your zinnias may come up again, but actually it's because the seeds drop and they're coming back from seed. The root does not stay viable for more than one year. And that's the difference between an annual and a perennial. There's another one uh, called a biennial that has a two-year life cycle. It's really a short, short life cycle perennial, a two-year life cycle. So also, you see the plant depth. This is a quarter of an inch. Let me tell you, if you decide you're going to plant zinnias and you plant them down deep, like you plant a corn seed, you know, you plant them down an inch and a half into the ground, they're not, the seed is not going to be able to find its way up to, to, the, uh, to, to search for the sun. It'll die. It'll rot. The whole seed will rot out and it won't be viable. So this is very important to understand the planting depth and, and, and not to plant too deep. And if you plant too shallow, a lot of times the, the plant grows a little and then it tips over. So really be cognitive of your planting depth. Another thing, thin to. Thin to is the distance between plants. When you grow zinnias, you, you, you make sure they're six inches apart from one another. Oftentimes the seeds we use are quite small and it's very difficult to actually only you know, plant one every six inches. So what people do sometimes is they end up planting a lot and then thinning them to that amount. I hate to kill viable plants. So when I have to thin a plant, I try very hard and it takes some practice, but you can do it. I try very hard to pull the, uh, the root out, the whole root and plant it elsewhere. The next section you see here is this is a zinnia and noted a flower. Most flowers like to have sun. So when we say sun, you know, especially when, we, when you hear full sun, full sun means almost eight hours a day of sun. I'll tell you, if I took some of these zinnias and I planted it um, over in the, the shady side of my house with northern exposure and, you know, where the, uh, the shade of the, the, the house is, um, I'll get a beautiful green plant, but I certainly won't get any flowers because the flowers like the sun. 
over here, uh, it says, this one here is start indoors. If you're gonna start them indoors, when do you do it? You do it three to four weeks before the last frost. That's when you start them indoors. Now, because we're zone six, we know our last frost date is between April 1st and April 21st. And I knew that because I know we're in zone six. So the reference all goes back to your zone when you're planning your garden. And for this particular you know, flower, when you do flowers, you like to know when it blooms because a lot of times I've seen a lot of flowers. My goodness, I went to the most beautiful flower garden in the world when I visited Giverny, France, and it was Monet's garden. My goodness gracious, the, the most beautiful flowers in the world. It was October and they were still coming and it's cool there. But they have different flowers coming you know, from, from April all the way to their, to their freeze, which is probably close to November. So you, you want something to bloom um, all year round. And this is a good one. You know, zinnias bloom from, from summer to fall. A lot of times your annuals will have a long, a long bloom. Of course, then they die out on you. So, so anyway, that's how to read a seed package. Sometimes when you get the seeds, and I told you about these places, dollarseed.com, as well as, uh, oh my goodness, uh, MI Gardener is $2 a pack and little, little Shop of Seeds is 75 cents a pack. A lot of times you won't have this information on the back. So what do you do? You revert to Google and say, you know, give me some information on zinnias. And one of the, one of the resources that's very good uh, is Farmer's Almanac. They have a whole bunch of this stuff up there and then they're more than willing to share. You don't have to have a subscription to Farmer's Almanac magazine. So, okay. So I do have a video to show you. And this is a, this is because I'm, you know, I, I do a lot of lectures on sustainability. I'm very cheap, um, very frugal person. I guess frugal is the nice word for cheap, but it's the same thing, right? So I wanted to tell you a little bit about winter sowing in mil also known as milk jug sowing, this particular version. You find a suitable container, you poke holes in the bottom for drainage or it will flood out. You cut open the container, but you leave a little latch uh, still attached in the back. You add your soil and you don't add seed starting soil because seed starting soil doesn't have any nutrients. You add a good potting soil or you can add some compost even. The seeds are gonna stay, I have mine out there now, those seeds are gonna stay in there until they decide to germinate and come up in the spring. So they need to be fed. So you don't wanna you know, just put peat moss in there or something that's an inert thing that you usually typically use when you're starting seeds uh, under the flats, under lights. So you plant your seeds, you add water, you use duct tape to seal the container, you label the container and you put it outside. It's that simple. For here in zone six, you can do just about any food crop and a lot of perennial flowers. I, um, I have a good friend. Uh, I don't know if any of you, you are uh, winter sow sowing. I believe it's called winter sowing with Cheryl Mann. Cheryl, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that she, uh, I might have upset her a little bit telling her that, you know, that I don't, I don't do summer crops like uh, eggplant, peppers, or, or, uh, or tomatoes. You can do those crops, warm weather crops. However, when you do, they come up later. So I want to plant mid-May. The first opportunity I get to get that stuff out there, I want to do it. But if you do want to try doing some warm weather crops, some melons or what have you, you can certainly try it. And when they do come up, believe me, they're going to be so hardy. You don't have to, you know, basically when you grow seeds from indoors, you have to, under lights, you have to take them outside for a little bit. They get used to it, bring them in. The second day you bring them out, you bring them in for close to a week to get them to be acclimated to the outside, a process called hardening off. With milk jug sowing, these plants are already used to being outdoors. They're hardy, they're strong, they're vibrant, but the summer weather crops do take a little bit longer. So if you want to, I mean, I, I plant mid-May. I'm in zone 6A, like I say. The, and, and climate change is, is uh, 
Climate's changed, folks. Used to be people used to sow, you know, their seeds around uh, Memorial Day, but you, you don't really have to wait that long anymore because we don't typically get a frost. And if we are going to get a frost on our tomatoes, typically I'll throw a, a light cotton sheet over it, uh, but, but I, I don't really have that issue here. Your mileage may vary on that. So anyway, um, so anyway, I'm going to show you. This guy is not in our zone, but he, he does have the, the video. Uh, the, he does have the stuff down pat. So let me just show you what, what he has to say about it. Today we are discussing winter sowing. This may be a concept with which many of you are not familiar. The idea behind winter sowing is to set seeds out in small plastic containers during the winter when it is still too cold for them to actually sprout. By using the plastic containers, you're creating a microclimate that is somewhat warmer than the outside temperature and allowing the seeds to get a jump start on the season as spring rolls around. This process also prevents the need to harden off plants to get them adjusted to being outside. This is my second year doing winter sowing. Last year, I even got tomatoes to grow using this method. But this year, I suck mostly with cold hardy crops. So let's look at the methodology step by step. First, find a suitable container. You want something that is clear plastic and is large enough for some soil and for the plant to grow. I mostly use milk jugs, but large gallon sized clear water bottles or juice bottles also work well. Step two, poke holes in the bottom of your container. The tops of these containers are going to be open to allow in moisture from rain or snow. The soil needs to drain well so that the bottle does not flood. Step three, cut open the container. I like to leave the handle on milk jugs intact so that it will hold everything together. And it sort of creates a hinge. Step four, add soil. I use compost, but a normal potting soil should work well as well. Step five, plant seeds. How many seeds and the appropriate spacing for your plants will vary based upon what you are growing, but use good judgment. These plants will be growing in here until you are ready to transplant, probably a couple of weeks after your last frost. For larger plants like tomatoes or peppers, I am comfortable with as many as four seeds spread on each of the four corners of the container. For smaller seeds, such as greens, you can sow even thicker. Step six, add water. If you are putting these out close to when you want them to start germinating, you will want to make sure the soil is well moistened. Step seven, use duct tape to close the container. You want to try to seal this as best you can. Step eight, use a permanent marker to label the outside of the container. I suggest writing on the duct tape. Put a label inside of the container. I use popsicle sticks. Step nine, place the plant outside. While this technique can be used any time of the year when you want to create a microclimate a bit warmer and more humid than the surrounding air, when winter sowing, you should generally put plants out before your last hard frost. By hard frost, I mean a period of more than four hours where the temperature is less than 25 degrees. Some people will let their winter sowing stay outside through most of the winter. But in climates where you have some particularly warm spells, which are followed by hard frosts, the warming may trigger germination and then kill your plants in the frost. If I am planning to put my winter sowing containers out early, I often skip the watering step after planting the seeds to help prevent the early trigger of germination. As you are getting close to the last hard frost and in the days that follow, you will want to make sure that your containers are getting moisture. Early spring often is a pretty moist period, so you may not have to supplementally water, but keep an eye on your precipitation during that period. This year I planted snow peas, beets, rutabagas, spinach, and turnips using this method. Tomorrow I will show you how they all did and if they're ready for transplant. I also am planting our golden crispy melon today using this method, 
and we'll let you know in the future episodes how it does. Have you ever done winter sewing? Let me know in the comments below what you like or dislike about the method. Are there any varieties that just don't seem to work for you when you try to use winter sewing? Okay. All right. So as I say, I leave them out there when I hear winter. What winter to me is, I believe it's December 21st. I leave them out there and I very rarely have a problem. The ones that I do here in our zone, all my brassica plants, my kale, my cabbage, my broccoli, my cauliflower. Um, I'm missing something. I know I'm missing. Brussels sprouts, also spinach. In any type of allium, chives, you know, chives, onions, garlic, leeks, they all do, I mean, excuse me, not garlic, garlic you plant in the, in the fall directly, the cloves in the ground. Onion, um, chives, and um, scallions, um, leeks, they do very well with, it, with this method. So try the summer ones as well if you want. This is a this is a light. Uh, this you know, uh, and if you see this little uh, pulley here, and this is what it is too. It's a pulley. When you first plant your seeds, sow your seeds. Believe it or not, you you want to give them light. You really want to take care of them. They don't need light. It sounds funny, but when you plant your seeds, they don't need light. They do need a warm area. And if you have a seed mat, you can pick up a seed mat for like $25 uh, for a good size one on the Amazon or uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, any of those places have them as well. And then once the seeds pop, you know they're ready to go into the lights, okay? So set up a lighted seed area and gather your growing containers. They sell the flats, like I say, you see under here, uh, the, it's like a grid and you fill it up with soil, with seed starting mix. You always use seed starting mix when you do this. Seed starting mix is, uh, is as I say, this for this method, it doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. It doesn't need a lot of nutrients. You're gonna be transplanting these plants into the garden. This is just to start them up. And you don't want to give them anything too strong because you can kill them. Uh, you can burn them. You don't want to do that. It's, it's like, you know, I have a, a, the, a, a little granddaughter's two months old. I, I certainly wouldn't serve her a steak. Steak has a lot of nutrition, but it's something that her little body wouldn't know what to do with the same thing here. You, could, you can do, uh, do more damage by, by using soil that's too rich. So anyway, you prepare your seed start, starting soil. Sow your seeds according to the instructions on the package. Keep them moist. Keep them moist by spraying them. Or you can actually bottom water them if you have a self-watering self planters. But basically, you can just use a sprayer. And you don't have to buy one. You can use one that you get at, uh, you know, that you use for the Windex. And then when it's empty, you can just clean it out real good and, you know, use a regular spray container. Something from with a bathroom cleaner. It doesn't matter. You're going to clean it out anyway. Uh, once you're, once you're, uh, it's funny, once you have some leaves, basically mostly all plants, once they germinate, you'll see them pop through the soil, but they pop through the soil. You'll see two leaves that pop them through the soil. And those are called the coitaldin leaves. And they're specifically for that purpose of popping seed through the soil. It's not a true leaf. For example, they're all round and they all look pretty much the same. So once your second set of leaves come out, that's known as your true leaf. So the second, the first set of leaves, say of a tomato plant, will come out, they'll be round and they'll look pretty much like a cucumber uh, planted that you really can't tell the difference. But once the second set of leaves, that means your plant is viable. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it'll, it, it's growing and you have to, you know, you can give it a little bit of fertilizer, but only use the fertilizer that's specifically made for seedlings. If you're going to use regular fertilizer, spray, you know, liquid fertilizer, water it down, you know, 80% water to 20% fertilizer. 
So uh, definitely, you don't want to use full strength fertilizer for the reason I, I explained. Also, sometimes, you know, you may want to put two or three seeds in there to make sure, you know, that that one takes. So and you and you thin them, you know, you survival of the fittest. And if you leave, if you have one little little uh, you know, area, one little cup for tomatoes, and you have five tomato seeds in there, they're gonna strangle each other out. You're not going none of them are gonna grow well. So you know you're gonna to have to pull some out if you're if you're talented and coordinated perhaps you can save them and plant them elsewhere or else try not to think about it and uh, just do 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 the needful so then once the seedlings get big you'll see they'll get big you have to plant them in you break them out of those flats and you put them into another a lot little bit of a larger container then you can use something like a potting soil or a uh, you know, with a little bit of compost in it. And you see those as a couple of kinds. There's the plastic ones. Typically, they have some kind of drainage to them. You can also poke a hole in the bottom of a, a solo cup and use that. Uh, however, uh, you have to make sure there's drainage. Okay. Then right before the, you know, you have your instructions on that particular plant, you know, when it's supposed to be planted, so about a week before you're going to plant it outdoors, start taking it in and taking it out and make sure it's acclimated. You know, it's used to being in that sunny area, you know, the, the lighted area in your, in your basement or wherever you have your light set up. It's not used to the wind. It's not used to the, the rain. So you really have to make sure you adjust it or it'll go into shock and die on you. What a horrible thing. That's happened to me. You know, I've had plants that I've, I've brought them outdoors to hard knock. We had an exceptionally warm day. It was like 90 degrees. I forgot to take them in. They all fried. I mean, it's horrible. You know, it's horrible. I had to buy tomatoes. I was mortified. Trust me. So anyway, uh, then you plant, transplant your seedlings in the, in the garden after you, hard, after you acclimate them called hardening off. Sowing method. Tomatoes, don't, so I'm a food grower, so... Tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers are nightshades. They can't be directly sown in the garden because our soil warms up too late in the season. Uh, and by the, you know, if you leave them in the sea, if you leave them in the ground to pop, you know, to, to germinate, you know, they'll come up probably June and then maybe in September they'll start to bear fruit or, or start to bear fruit. And then we'll have a free hard freeze before you get the lion's share of the fruit. So you can buy them at the store, or you can certainly start them from seed under lights. Kale, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts, those are your brassicas. They can also be started under lights or the milk jug method. And as I said, the milk jug method, your plants will be slower, uh, they'll, they'll be smaller, but they'll certainly catch up first. No need to harden them off, very hardy in the cheapskates way. And you know what, when you, you don't have to use milk jugs, you can use juice jugs, uh, or you can use the, the two gallon container people use for water. But it's good to give that plastic a second life. And you can actually clean them out and use them the next season. You know, we have far too much plastic in our environment. And it's really hurting the environment. So you, and if you don't have any, you know, I asked my neighbors, you save me those jugs. I try to decrease my footprint, you know, my carbon footprint, but, but I'm not too proud to, to ask for them. So, so also, um, you know, there are people that do this differently. This is my mileage. This is my, you know, analysis. Carrots, beets, turnips, those are root veggies. They should be sown directly in the garden when it's time. Why? Because they have long, thin roots and it's so easy to make one go crooked and then it ends up dying on you. And they don't take that long. So I would just direct sow those right outside. Peas and beans, they're legumes, uh, very healthy for you or vegetarians use them as meat substitutes. You can grow them outside as well. You can grow them indoors, you know, they'll take, but you know, your pea, once it gets going, it can grow two or three inches in a day. They're gonna tangle and, and they're very hard to, they're very hard to deal with. So, uh, 
So it's, it's the easiest to grow, grow them outdoors unless you really want to try it. You can certainly try it. Melon, cucumber, squash, and uh, mel melon, cucumber, squash are in the cucurbit family. And then also corn, you can direct sow them or you can start them indoors. Sometimes they get too big and hard to keep indoors. They don't like being outdoors. So I would start them two or three weeks before the calendar tells you that you're supposed to plant them outside. They can't be, you can't do them, you know, eight weeks in advance like you do your, uh, your, your cucumber, your, uh, your uh, excuse me, your tomatoes. They, they won't live, they'll die on you. Spinach, chard and arugula, the, the, you know, your greens, they, they can be grown pretty much any method. So let's talk about uh, cross-pollination. Okay, I tell you to save your seeds. And um, in order to save your seeds, a couple of things you have to know. You can save your bean seeds because, you know, you just leave a few out there and, and, and they'll, you know, you, you pick them, you just leave a few out there and then open them up. And those are your seeds for next year. Uh, beet seeds, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, cabbage, cauliflower. Those are all biennials. They won't come to seed until the second year. And also we talk about cross pollination. So if you do leave these plants out to grow, a second year, uh, then you may have some cross-pollination effect if you're saving seed. Just to give an example, uh, carrot. Carrot is a biennial plant and it's, it's, the, it's the hybridized version of Queen Anne's lace. Okay, so if you leave your carrot seeds out there, you know, year after year, until it goes to seed and you save them. It may be cross-pollinating with your Queen Anne's lace. And Queen Anne's lace is a very rooty, hard, uh, not too tasty uh, root. So just, just be careful of anything that has, that can cross-pollinate with another variety. Example, uh, we'll, we'll take it, let's take this one for example, cucumber. I grow many cucumbers. I grow lemon cubes. I don't know if anyone's ever grown a lemon cube, but they're probably about the size of a, a soft, no, not a softball, less, maybe a baseball, maybe a, maybe between a softball and baseball, if they're big. I also grow the little, little pickling cubes. And I also grow some along the English cubes, the burpless cubes, they call them. So if, if I grow multiple cucumbers within a reasonable proximity of each other, and I save the seed, if I save the seed from the yellow cube, when I go to plant that seed, it may not come out looking like the yellow cube. It may look like a, a, a yellow, half yellow cube and half, um, you know, and half English cube. So that would be pretty different. So you, you don't um, typically only plant one cucumber, type of cucumber, um, however, if you do plant more than one type of cucumber, which I insist on doing, I just buy new seed every year. The more cross-pollination things to be concerned with hot peppers. If you save the seeds from your peppers, your jalapenos and your bell peppers, they may cross, the seeds may cross-pollinate with one another. And here's one, the, the most notorious cross-pollinators are your squash, melon, and cucumbers. They're in the cucurbit family. This is because they have a male flower and a female flower. And, the, and they're pollinated by the wind. So I'm just gonna tell you how to read this matrix. This is, this is a, just a reference material. And as I say, this is a lot of material here. Seeds are not easy to teach, you know, to teach in one hour, trust me. I could have a lot more material on. So, uh, but just, just explain this, a, a straight neck squash, you know, the yellow, they call them summer squash, as opposed to a crooked neck squash, which is almost the same thing, but the neck is different. It's in the family Kirkabita pepo. So it can cross pollinate with any other variety of straight neck squash or crooked neck squash or a patty pan 
or an acorn squash, some pumpkin, some spaghetti squash, and some delicata squash. Also, also zucchini, which I forgot to put in this matrix for some reason. If you, if you grow butternut squash, butternut squash can hybridize or cross pollinate with any other butternut squash, some pumpkin. So this will tell you. So, so in theory, let's go here. Crocobita maxima is a, is a Hubbard. There's nothing, but I think Hubbard squash is delicious. And they're big, so you could, one will last you quite a few pies, breads. You know, I cut them up. I, I cut them up into fries and put them in the air fryer and make make French fries out of them. So uh, Hubbard squash, um, it it will cross pollinate with the buttercup, some pumpkin, and other types of Hubbard squash. So if you want to keep the integrity of your plant, you'll only grow one Crocobita maxima, one Crocobita pepper, one of each variety. But if you do, you know, want to grow several different types of squash, you can just don't save the seed. Same thing, oh, excuse me. Same thing with your, this is just an uh, uh, updated, uh, up and close and personal uh, cross-pollination matrix of the brassicas. So in theory, you can have some, some hybridized, some turnips with some bok choy. I don't know what that would look like, but it might not be pleasant. You have green mustard and red mustard, but they could cross pollinate and maybe you'll have a brown mustard plant. Mustard's a great, great uh, crop, to, great uh, brassica, very tasty, leaves it nice and tender and sweet. So heirloom plants, let's talk about heirloom plants. Heirloom plants have been grown and the seeds have been saved for several generations. Heirloom varieties are open pollinated, which means unlike hybrids, the seeds you collect from year to year will be, have the same characteristics as the parent plant. So many, many heirloom varieties are preserved by home gardeners who save the seeds from families year after year. I'm gonna tell you a couple of, cross, a, a couple of heirloom uh, varieties, okay? Tomatoes are big for that. San, San Marzano is an heirloom variety of tomato. Pink brandywine is an heirloom variety of tomatoes. Now there's one thing that's uh, common in, in heirlooms is, you know, they've been pollinated and, you know, they've, they've kept the integrity of them, but a lot of times they have, they have issues. You know, they're prone to blight and a lot, some of them don't, produce, you know, they may produce really wonderful sweet fruit, but perhaps not so much. So what some people do, and this is not the same as a GMO, they actually, they actually intentionally cross pollinate. I want to tell you why. I'm going to just explain this. I know it's kind of complicated, but you can have a Roma tomato, which is really good for a sauce tomato. Okay. And, but they're kind of small. And then you can have a big juicy beef steak, which isn't good for a sauce tomato because your sauce will be like water. But if you want a big fat juicy sauce tomato, you know, people in Burpee have hybridized the two and now they have one called the super sauce tomato. And it's a big one, like a beef steak. So these are wonderful plants. However, they haven't been hybridized, they haven't been um, standardized for a long enough time to consider it to be um, an heirloom. And if you save the seeds from that hybrid plant, the offspring may look like a bee steak or it may look like a Roma. You really never know. So you take, uh, you know, you go by, by chance. One time I had a cross pollination, um, you know, I, I thought I was going to be a smarty pants and, and save some hybridized plants. And I had some of these squashes, picked them up and they just fell apart in my hand. Something about those squashes just wasn't, wasn't viable. So, and that, that can happen. Or you may have a happy accident as that guy, Bob Ross used to say. And you know that, you know, so anyway, you, it's, it's, you know, your mileage may vary. So when are the crops ready? Uh, when are the crop, the seeds ready to be harvested? Well, my grandfather was from Italy and he was a big gardener and 
he had a victory guard. He was born in the 1800s, which go, goes to tell you how old I am. Um, but he, you know, he had a victory guard when, he, when he, he came here to the Boston area. And, you know, he used to take the biggest tomato, the biggest, juiciest tomato that you just really were dying to put in that tomato sandwich with, you know, salt, pepper, and crusty bread. And he'd leave it in the side of the garden because he wanted really it to mature so the seeds would mature. A lot of times when we eat fruit, uh, we eat the, the veggies, we eat the cucumbers or what have you, those seeds uh, are not really, have, are not ready. We have to have a seed that, we have to have a fruit that's starting to get a little bit soft, you know, in order to know that the seeds are done developing. And those are the seeds you want to save. Couple of ways to save them and, and we'll go over this. You know, if it's a seed like you know, I, I, like lettuce, as I say, lettuce will bolt the seed in the summertime. Take the whole, let, the, let it dry out. Take the plant, put it upside down in a paper bag, then shake it after it's dry and you'll get three or 400 seeds from one, one uh, lettuce plant. But there are some seeds from, that you harvest wet. And those are basically your tomato and your cucumber plants. They have a gelatinous membrane on them and they have to be processed a little bit differently. And I have a little bit of a video on that. Okay. All right, here he is. Bear with this. I like, I like to, I like this guy. He's kind of funny, but bear, bear with me. He has a little bit of an accent because um, he's from Australia. Okay. Been busy saving some seeds from a few different plants in the garden over the last couple of weeks and I thought I'd bring you along and start to show you how we're collecting the seeds for next spring's plantings for us. Being in the southern hemisphere we're just coming into winter here. The first one is the cucumber. These are seeds, whee, these are seeds from the gimpy gold cucumber behind me. You can probably see just up there a large yellow lump. That's actually one of the fruits that's very mature. It's coming on to almost ready to fall off the vine. We're letting them go on the vine as long as we can to make sure we can get as many viable seeds as possible from it. We'll be sharing these, so that's why I'm letting that one hang a little bit longer. The, this variety is very hardy, especially here in the subtropics. And it was actually developed in Gympie, hence the name Gympie Gold, which is just north from us, about a two hour drive. So the reason I liked these guys is they're extremely fruit fly resistant. And the only problem we did have with fruit flies were when a caterpillar bored into the fruit, little fruit flies found the hole that the caterpillar left and went in and laid the eggs. And that cucumber just ended up being a mess. Very goopy inside, so I just cut it open and gave it to the chooks and they got a nice treat. So I've ended up collecting a fair few of these seeds and I'm pretty happy with what we've got. We'll be able to share a few around to different people. Also have that one and another one upstairs, so we'll end up with more than enough seed, I think. So anyway, let's get to it and I'll show you how I collected these guys and prepared them. So what I have here is a cucumber, about a third of the one that we're going to use in the salad tonight. So all I'm going to do is cut it open. So to grab these seeds out, it's pretty much all as easy as just cutting your spoon, a little teaspoon, and just scraping them out like that. And I'll show you what these little seeds look like. Don't know if you can make that out, but it actually has a little bit of a gel sac around it. So what you want to do, the same as tomato seeds, you want to ferment this off. So it's pretty much all as easy as grabbing a bowl, whoa, <laughs> squeezing seeds all over the floor. <laughs> no, just squeezing these seeds out of here. Doesn't matter if a bit of the um, more meatier bits go in there as well. Might as well do both halves of this cucumber while I'm at it. Some left inside the cucumber as well. So once you've collected all your seeds, this isn't going to waste. We're actually going to put that in tonight's salad, so I'll just stick that to one side. Once you get these guys into the bowl, it's just a matter of adding a little bit of extra moisture and letting them sit for a day or two. Just add a little bit of extra moisture in there. What that will do is it'll start fermenting the gel around the outside. I have some here I did three days ago and I'm just going to 
empty these through a sieve and then give them a bit of a rinse and I'll pull one out and we'll compare the two together. There we go, I'll just pop them in there, stick to the mesh a bit, give them a bit of a tap. So just to compare the two, this one here has had the gel coating fermented off and you can see the little bit at the end there where it was tethered to the cucumber and this one here is still in the gel coating. So you can actually squeeze these guys, it's a very slippery very very slippery procedure and we <laughs> get the gel coat as you can see there <laughs> to come off the seed. I'll just go grab the seed. <laughs> there you go this is seed. So you can actually just squeeze this little gel sack off and you end up with a nice fairly clean seed. But as you can see, it can be a little bit of a um, hazard to anybody sitting nearby. So that's why I think just this fermenting works a little bit better. Just sticking them in the bowl there and letting the gel come off that way. So it's easy enough to do. And yeah, these guys now will just be dried out on this paper here. There we go. So that's more than enough for us to have a couple of plants next year and we'll be able to share some around. And we have three more fruit on the vine, so we'll be able to get some seeds from them as well, hopefully. And there's the next batch just fermenting there, so... Saving cucumber seeds is pretty easy, really. And the chooks get to have a bit of a treat. So there's... So, yeah, the interesting thing about that, as I said, is that the cucumbers and the... And the um, cucumbers and tomatoes both have a gelatinous sac, and you have to soak them off for a day or two. So, and it's actually mold that comes to the top. It looks whitish and that's okay. That's part of the process. So, uh, storing seeds. Let's talk about storing, storing seeds. The secret to successful seed storing is cool and dry. You know, cool and dry. You know, if you have a, if you have a, and I say cold and dry as well. If you have a freezer and enough room to put your seeds in it, definitely use a seal a meal or a, a food saver and you know seal up the whole bag full of different types of seeds and and store them in there for the next year you're 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 great other than that i suggest in your basement or your cool garage don't worry about them freezing they don't care as a matter of fact some seeds are better when they're cold stratified that's what they call them some seeds won't grow unless they're unless they're frozen first so away from any light source because when the seed what happens when seeds see the light when seeds see the light, they try to grow towards it. So you may have some, some uh, blooming or, you know, in, when I say cool, it's because when, when seeds reach a certain temperature, they want to germinate as well. So uh, cool and dry or, or cold and dry and freezing is optional. Now, how long do seeds last? This is a list and, if, and, and this I'm sure isn't complete because there's a, like 50,000 gazillion different plants you can grow. But this is just an average. For example, Brussels sprout seeds last for four years. Uh, tomato seeds last uh, an average of four years. Watermelon seeds, four years. But you notice onions, parsley, parsnips, they're very tiny, flimsy seeds. And typically they only, they only last a year. But you know what? There's no, there's no uh, hard and fast rule on that. So if you have some onions and you didn't grow them, Instead of putting, you know, one onion in a whole, one onion seed in a hole, put two in a hole and see see what you get. So not all of them in the pack are going to die at once. So you you you, you know, in the in over time the the viability the germination rate uh, goes lower. But by all means, don't throw your seeds away. But on the average, I'd say on the average, uh, you can say if you have to if you have to do an average. Seeds last about three years. So when at the end of the year, when you see a, sh a store and they do, you see them a lot. Uh, uh, Christmas tree shop has them, job lot has them. You know, they want to get rid of their year old seeds because they can't sell them as new. Buy them. Buy them. Certainly buy cabbage seeds. You, even if you knock off one year, if the, if the seeds are end of season, you'll still have uh, you know, three years worth of viability from those seeds. And, and a lot of times you can get them with, for 10 cents on the dollar. So, so that's it on that. Do we have any questions in the chat? 
No, no questions at the moment. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, the um, is if anybody has any questions, it's uh, it's just a small group at the moment. So if you want to just unmute yourselves. Yeah, um, that's fine. Or I can, if you raise your hand, I can allow you to talk, or you can type into the chat, and we can wait. We can wait a couple of minutes for that. Okay. Um, and while while we're here, I'll take any question. Any question related to gardening that you have, I'll be more than happy to, happy to answer it. While I'm here, I'm going to type my website in there, Veggie Gardens com, Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens com. Oh, here's a couple of messages. Yes, I do, uh, Angel. Angel, thank you very much for asking. Do I have tips for preventing veggie starts from getting leggy? Veggie starts get leggy because they're searching towards the light. First of all, as I suggested before the before the germination takes place, vegetables. I mean, any kind of seed does not multitask well. Either it's growing root, or it's growing you know, it's in volume or it's bearing fruit or what have you. So in the initial stage, when you plant it, you want it to start growing down to give you some root, you know, some foundation. So you don't put it under any light until it germinates. And when it germinates, what you do is you put that light directly above, you know, those, those, let me see if I can pull that one up here with me here. Okay, bear with me. Oh, I didn't I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me just pull that slide up. This slide. This is adjustable. This light goes up and down. So when the, when the seeds first germinate, you want to make sure they get a ton of light. If they get the light they need, they won't start trying to grow towards the light. They'll have plenty. They'll grow. They'll stay short. They'll start to thicken up, which is what they need to do. Because if they grow leggy, they're just going to burn out. So, uh, so, so the secret is don't give them any light until they germinate. And when they do germinate, keep the light directly above them and raise it up. Um, you know, as the plants grow. Any other questions? So Dave, we had a question come into the Q&A module. Um, okay. It's from Anitha. She says, um, they say, can I grow using grocery store bought seeds, for example, from mustards, cilantro, et cetera? Oh, if you bought seeds in the grocery store or, okay, so first of all, if you harvest seeds from grocery store uh, purchases that you bought for food, uh, a lot of times they are treated and they, the seeds from those products will not, uh, will not germinate. So, uh, but if you grow, if you buy seeds from grocery store, you know, a lot of times they have seeds, even two packs for a dollar or what have you, those should, those should be fine. Uh, mustard, cilantro, and all that. If you buy the seeds in the pack, they should be fine. A lot of times buying seeds is like buying perfume. You know, it's all depends on the, the brand. I think there's inflation depending upon what the, what the brand is. Provide, oh, so, uh, so Anita, uh, uh, tips for succession, succession planting. I can't. And let me just give you a couple of examples for, for succession, for succession succession planting. As I say, uh, carrot, beet, beans, peas, um, and what else? Beans, peas, uh, carrot, beet, uh, lettuce. Those plants, um, the minute really, honestly, when they, before they even come up, you can start planting another variety. Uh, and you, I would say to, to use different varieties because, you know, some, so they don't all sprout at the same time. So, uh, 
you know, you need to have a little bit more room and you need to be willing to pull out a plant that's still alive because it's no longer producing. It's at the end of its life cycle. It's hard for me to kill plants that are still alive just because they're starting to peter out. But if you have, you know, I, you know, what I do, just give you an example, bean, peas. I love peas, love peas. I, I, I try not to eat a lot of meat. So peas, I grow, I start a bunch, purple ones, uh, you know, sugar snaps, all kinds of peas, potted peas. And um, I start them inside. And then when I plant them, I also plant them by hand. I, I put the, so I have different kinds and I have them started at different intervals. So I'll have a constant supply of peas. Uh, and that's basically what you do uh, for succession planting. Always have something going. You don't want to wait till your lettuce is petered out and went to seed. And then you say, oh, drought, I have to start some more. Really, um, you know, you should have more than one type going at the same time. Carrot seeds are cheap. There's a million kinds, so they won't all uh, fizzle out at the same time. On. Uh, you, you use hoops to protect your cool crops, cover, the, cover with frost cover, your thoughts on such a setup. You want to extend the lifetime of your plants. Hoops are great. You can use a, 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 a garden fabric, which is a, a w basically white and porous. Uh, the wind goes through them. You don't have any mold issues because the rain goes through them. However, um, you know it doesn't have the warmth. If you if you use uh, a, a plastic material that it, you know, the, it can be 15 degrees warmer in, with that plastic. So you may have a tendency to, to, to damage some of your plants due to the heat. But it's a good idea. I, I, use, I have a greenhouse actually. So it is a good idea to use them, but there's the, there's the, 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 the plastic and then there's the, what they call garden fabric. And if you have the opportunity to look into both, both of those, that would be great. Any other questions? Let's go to the I think chat. Jeff put a question into the chat, which is okay. um, what distance from the plants should the light be? And I think Angel Jackson did, Angel did put in a, um, an answer there if you want to read through it and see if you have anything else to add to it. Yeah. Okay. I often have 72 count plug trays, is often enough soil. Uh, yeah. Directly above. So, Oh, sorry. Never mind. I misunderstood. I thought he was answering. I thought they oh, were answering, okay. but oh, okay. they're two separate questions. Yeah. 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 The, uh, the you, directly above, if you have a light that's, uh, if you have the LED light, they're very cool. If you have the, uh, the fluorescent light, I would say six inches above, but you can go lower with the, 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 uh, the newer lights, the LED lights are actually better in the, in the, in the, the, they have a better spectrum and you can go lower and you can, you can flood the, the, the plants with as much light as they need. Um, okay. Okay. What distance? So, so as low as you want with the LED and six inches above with the, uh, with the fluorescent, uh, angel often have used a 72, Okay, enough soil near to start for plants, so you need bigger pot. Okay, uh, 72 is a lot. Let me just let me just explain a little bit about seed starting. Um, you know, some plants come up fast and some plants come up slow. Celery can take 20 days to germinate. And, uh, you know, corn can take 10 days and grows real tall. So you really, unless you want to grow 72 uh, plants of the same size, you're better off to have a little bit of a smaller, uh, you know, get, get, I have some, you know, flats that have 10. So I can put the same, basically that, you know, I'll put cabbage and broccoli together or something that germinates at the same time. But 72 is a lot. And yes, usually they get too big. If you do them early and you want really nice big tomato plants, you're gonna probably have to transplant them. And there's a couple of options, there's more than a couple, but plastic, you can use, as I say, your solo cups or, or your, uh, a, 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 a good size, uh, uh, what do you call it? The yogurt container 
or you can use the peat pots. If you, if you put them in peat pots, you know, they, you can bury the whole pot. So those are, those are made from the, uh, the peat moss. So, and you're right. Uh, you probably don't want to use a, an ambient light for, for the plants. The seedlings really do them. If you're doing, a, if you're really going to be sustainable, you really need to get a, a fairly decent uh, light system or, or you can just get a, green, heat, a greenhouse and heat it. So like I, I have that, the, 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 I, this is my first year. I think they're going to love the light. I'm going to, I'm going to try both. I'm trying the winter sewing and the milk jugs. I will try to do it on the lights and I will try to do some in the greenhouse. I will try to triplicate some of the, the products I'm producing and so that I can teach it better, so. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, let's go back to here. All right, promise last question, vine of squash borers. I'm going to tell you about vine and squash borers, okay? Vine and squash borers are horrible. You have to, you have, once they're there, you have to do surgery on the plant to actually, with a sharp exacto knife and uh, to get those, those sons of guns out. What you can do for them, and I'm going to tell you, uh, and this is a little bit pricey, I don't know how big the garden is, but uh, you can use what they call uh, beneficial nematodes. And you'll have to Google that, beneficial nematodes. And what they are is they're little tiny, I don't know if it's a bacteria, some kind of life form that you put in water and spray it all over your plant. And what it does is it somehow or another, anything that has a soft body, like a uh, uh, larva from an insect or a beetle or any kind of bug, it actually pierces them and kills them. So do research on beneficial nematodes. It's completely organic. So, and they'll, and they'll do a number on vine boys. They're horrible. I, I had the same problem with a client of mine. So any other questions? I don't think there were any others. Um, did you get to the second part of Anitha's question about tomato blight? Oh, and blossom uh, and drop? Can you read it to me? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. No, that's fine. It's a so I think the first part they were just clarifying. Um, the and then the second part was also tomato blight and blossom end rot and how to manage and prevent. Okay, uh, blossom end rot is is due to a calcium deficiency. So the best thing to do is now is to put lime in your soil now because it'll take quite a while for it to actually work in and change your, and, and add the, the calcium to your soil. Tomato blight, what you can do for tomato blight is first rotate your crops and make sure you, you're not uh, you know, growing them in the same, your tomatoes in the same place because it, it can be quite stubborn. If you have a small bed or you're growing in containers, definitely swap out the soil. Do not save any product that's infected with the blight. Burn it or trash it and put it out, you know, put it out in your trash, but do not put that stuff in your compost. You can put some, you can treat the soil itself with diatomaceous earth um, because that should also uh, condition the soil. Um, but you, as I say, you can, you can use some lime uh, that will, which is, is calcium something. I'm not talking about lime from the juice, you know, from the fruit. I mean, the, the uh, calcium chloride or something is that, and it actually has that, but you have to do it a, a few months before you plant. And, the, and, that, and also spacing, blossom end rot, um, you have to make sure you space your plants properly or they won't get watered properly and therefore they won't absorb the calcium. So don't overcrowd your plants as well. And if you do get blossom end rot, you can't get rid of it on those, but what you can do is cut off all the affected, uh, branches and the affected fruit and try to manage it with a copper-based fungicide. So it's going to be an effort, but send me an email if you want. I, get, I put my, I put my, uh, uh, my uh, contact information in the chat and um, we can chat further on it if you want. Any other questions? 
<clears throat> no new questions came in. I'm going to share this recording with um, everybody who registered. So they may email out, they may reach out to you from with more questions after they've had no a chance worries. to watch it. No. Yep. That's and, great. Um, Our but that was very informative. I really appreciate all your time tonight. Thank you so much. And I think it was very really good. helpful to the people who are watching. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.